Well, good morning again, everybody. Today we're going to do a standalone message entitled, What's Your Top Five? Abby Reed, what's your top five? What are your top five movies in descending order? Number five, four, three, two, one. Go ahead, tell us. Okay, number... You got to stand up, stand up, stand up. Um, I had to write these down. I was afraid I'd forget them. Okay, number five, I have Grease. Number four, I have Urban Cowboy. And I just realized I must really like John Travolta. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Number three, I have Raising Arizona. Um, (laughs) Yes. Um, (laughs) Number two, I have Forrest Gump. And then number one, I have Pretty in Pink because I'm an 80s baby. So. All right. Can't say I relate, but thank you for that. Okay. That was awesome. Zeb Alexander, what is your top five? What are your top five foods? Descending order. Five, four, three, two, one. Go ahead. I have to start with my wife's pork chops that she makes. That's They're a wise amazing. idea. That's good. Uh, then I would say pizza, almost of any kind, whether it's frozen in my freezer and I heat it up or it's at West Crust. Um, I love a juicy cheeseburger and then uh, a well-prepared ribeye steak mm-hmm. and then any kind of ice cream. All right. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> All right. Richard Allen. Happy anniversary to Alan Denise and also my wife and I our anniversary day too. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. That's great. Okay, what's your top five? Blake Buchanan. Where's Blake? Blake's over here. Blake, what are your top five in descending order sports teams? Oh, man. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with uh, pro off the first and just say the New Orleans Saints for me. Okay. Uh, let's move it to baseball. Let's go with Texas Rangers after that. All right. Um, I'm going to bring it back local and uh, go with the Trinity Lions would be there in third <laughs> spot. Number two would be the team I coach would be the Lubbock Titans. And uh, probably the number one team in the nation right now would have to be the Texas Tech Red Raiders. All so right. Go Tech. Today we are asking the question, what's your top five, which is really all about priorities. I want to illustrate for you Uh, For just a moment, what we have here, if I can open it up, jar, small stones. If you take these small stones and you pour them into the jar, and then you attempt to put five large rocks into this jar, they will not fit. They're over the top. If you do the exact opposite, hang on, and take the five rocks and place them in first, and then take the same small stone. It's not cheating. And you pour them in. Hang on. It worked for a service. For the most part. (laughs) They fit in. Now, here's the moral of the illustration. The jar is your life. Small stones are the small stuff, but the stuff that comes at us like every day. Things that vie for our attention and for our energy and for our time. The things that really aren't that important and rather insignificant, those are the small stones. And then there are the five large rocks. These are the things that are important. These are the things that should be priorities. But I don't know if you notice this. It just seems to be the way life works. If you allow your life to get filled up with all the small stuff, somehow the large stuff, the important stuff, gets crowded out. So it's important to keep first things first, to have priorities, to keep the important things the important things so that they don't, in fact, get crowded out. You may have heard me reference not too long ago. It was probably about six weeks ago. I referenced the book that was written, I don't know, probably 12, 13, 14 years ago, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Anybody remember that book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff? And, you know, for the most part, I sign on. I think, I think it's, it's got some good ideas. Where I get off the train with that book is with the subtitle. The subtitle is, And It's All Small Stuff. 
Don't sweat the small stuff, and it's all small stuff. Let me just tell you right now, it's not all small stuff. It's not. Again, the stuff that gets thrown at us every day, those little things, those annoying things that sometimes take all our time. Yeah, that's small stuff, and you shouldn't sweat that. But not everything is a small thing. Uh, That book asks the question time and time again, Will it matter in 100 years from now? And if it doesn't matter in 100 years from now, well, you shouldn't sweat it. Well, again, a lot of things don't, won't matter in 100 years from now, but there are things that will. The five priorities, the five large rocks that we will cover today, they will matter in 100 years from now. As a matter of fact, they have eternal consequences, and so they'll matter 10,000 years from now. Um, I heard... Uh, a message like the one I'm going to do for you today. I heard a message on the top five biblical priorities. I heard it back in 1985, 27, 28 years ago. And from then till now, I have remembered the top five biblical priorities. How many of you know, if you can remember five points in a message you heard 27 years ago, it was probably a God moment for you. It was for me. And that's kind of what I wanted to share with you today. Now, one of the things that I have learned about the top five priorities that we'll discuss uh, over the next few minutes is that there is a very definite order. And if you get them out of order, your life will be out of order. And what you'll find is increased stress and frustration and anxiety. You find a lack of personal and spiritual growth. But conversely, if we do put the big rocks in our jar first and in order, well, then it just seems like life works the way God intended it to a whole lot more. So, in descending order, uh, are you ready for rock number five? Rock number, priority number five is your commitment to your local church. It's true. Church makes the top five. It is number five, but it does make the top five. And I know for some of us, that's an aha moment in and of itself. But I want you to take a look at Hebrews chapter 10 with me. We're going to read it out of the Message Bible Take a look at how it's paraphrased there. Starting in verse 23, it says, Let's keep a firm grip on the promises that keep us going. He always keeps his word. How many of you are glad about that, right? He always keeps his word. Let's see how inventive we can be in encouraging love and helping out. Watch this. Not avoiding worshiping together as some do, but spurring each other on, especially as we see the big day approaching. How many of you know that the church is God's idea? It is God's idea. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church is ecclesia, and it means the called out ones. Uh, The church was designed to be a place where people like us would find hope, And we'd find encouragement, and then we'd find lots of other people, lots of other very imperfect people like us who will be there for us in our time of need. Um, The church is where we worship together. Now, I know in our vernacular and in our vocabulary, the word together doesn't hold a, a real preeminent spot for us. But in biblical principles, the word together is a powerful word. It's important to worship together. The Bible says in Psalm 133, for instance, that God commands his blessing where brethren dwell together in unity, where we dwell together in unity. Jesus said, if any two of you gather together in my name, I will be in the midst of you. And then you look throughout the book of Acts, and you see time and time again where people dwelt together. They were one heart, one mind, in one accord, the Bible says. There was, they lived in, in, in community, common unity. And in that, the only place in the entire Bible where it says a people uh, experienced great grace and great power, mega caris and mega dunamis, is where they dwelt together. There's something about togetherness, unity, community that God blesses. The local church is where we live out. It's where we flesh out the spiritual fact that because Jesus 
uh, his body was broken, that he shed his blood on Calvary's cross, that now we are the body of Christ. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12 where it says, For as the body is one and has many members... But all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. We are many, but we are one. You need me, I need you, we need each other. And let me just throw this in there, and I said it in the first service. I think that's why, you know, all of the church hopping and the church shopping that is prevalent in our society, and dare I say it, in our city, Yep, I said it. That's why that stuff can be so unhealthy and so unscriptural. It's important to find a church family and plug in. Thank you for those three amens. That was like awesome. Gave me chill bumps. But anyway, it's important. Check it out. Psalm 92 verse 13 says this. Those who are planted, those who are planted, In the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord. So if you take a healthy plant and you repot it, and you repot it, and you repot it, and I don't like the color of this pot, so I'm going to go in this pot. And I'd like a little more sunshine, please, so I'm going to go to this pot. And I didn't get enough irrigation, so I'm going to this pot. And if you keep repotting, repotting, guess what? That plant's not going to flourish. That that plant's going to languish. It'll eventually wither and shrivel up. But if we are planted in the house of God, you know, letting our roots grow deep, we will flourish. So, so, you know, so be planted. Be functioning. Don't, don't be flaky and flighty. Be solid. Serve. Be consistent. Give. Worship. Be fully engaged. Be all in. See, and, and here's what will happen. When you inevitably go through it, how many of you know we all go through it? Whatever the it is, we go through it. When you inevitably, inevitably go through it, then your church, your brothers and sisters that you are connected to, that you are planted with, they will be there for you. They'll be there for you in ways that you can't just sign up for when you get a crisis. In other words, I'm not a part of a local fellowship, but I've got a crisis. Oops, I need a church. It doesn't work that way, although... Truth be told, we get those calls all the time. We got those calls on Christmas Eve. You know, oh, I'm in a jam. I, I don't belong to any church. Can you help me? You know what we do? We help them. There's no doubt about it. You know, we don't, we, we don't, we don't do that. You know, we're not checking our rosters and things like that. You know, we help them the best we can. But I've got to tell you, there's a difference. There's a difference when somebody from our church family that we know that's part of us, when they have an issue, you know what we do? We drop everything, and they become our primary focus, that we will help you get through it. Why? Because we're one. We're many, but we're one. We're in a body together. We're connected. We're doing life together. And so if you've got an issue, your church will be there for you. You know, if, if God forbid you lose a loved one, your church will be there for you. If you need a word of encouragement, your church will be there for you. If you need a word from God in season, your church will be there for you. So be sure to have rock number five firmly in your jar, your commitment to your local church. Priority number four. Ready? Your dedication to work. To work. I didn't think I'd get any amens on that. But anyway, your dedication to work. Church is God's idea. Work is God's idea. I don't know if you know that. Working is God's idea. God himself worked for six days in creation and then rested on the seventh. Now, rest is important too, but it doesn't make the top five. But anyway, he, he, he worked, right? When he placed Adam in the garden, the first thing he had Adam do was work. Tend and keep the garden. He put Adam in that garden and said, you better work it. Tell the person next to you, you better work it. Go ahead, tell him right now. Say, you better work it. Tell him. Come on. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10 says this. It says, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Work is a blessing. Now, some people don't know the blessing they have until they lose it. 
But God blesses the work of our hands. The Bible actually says that we are to work with our hands so that we may have something to give. And, and, and it's not only whether we work or not, it's all about how we work. You know, th this arena may be a number four priority, but please understand this. The workplace is our number one mission field. It's our number one mission field. It's where, you know, it's where we spend a ton of our time. It's where people are watching us and they are listening to us and they, you know, they, they listen to the kind of conversation we either do or do not engage in at the water cooler or at the vending machine. You know, what, uh, what kind of attitude do we have towards our workload? How, how do we handle adversity and disappointment and deadlines? I want you to take a look with me, and we'll project to Titus chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 in the Amplified Bible. Please understand that the context here is, is ancient first century world where uh, we're speaking specifically about bond servants and masters. Now, real quickly, a bond servant was not a slave as we would know. A bond servant was actually somebody who was released, free to go on their own, and they said, I don't want to go. I want to stay here in this house because my life here is better than if I were on my own. It was actually a servant out of love. Greek, a doulos, which is it's just a beautiful teaching. Every single New Testament writer called themselves a bond servant of Christ, just to let you know. But so that's really the, the immediate application is bond servant, doulos, and master. But there are definite parallels into contemporary life between, let's say, employee and employer. It says, tell bond servants to be submissive to their masters, to be pleasing and give satisfaction in every way. Warn them not to talk back or contradict, nor to steal by taking things of small value but to prove themselves truly loyal and entirely reliable and faithful throughout, watch this, so that in everything they may be an ornament and do credit to the teaching which is from and about God our Savior. The old saying goes, you know, your, your attitude is contagious. Is yours worth catching? I, I would say to you, your life is speaking loudly. What is it saying? Because if you'll notice, you and I, we adorn or we hang ornaments upon the gospel of Jesus Christ by our attitude and our demeanor and our behavior at work. So be courageous and put your commitment to Christ on display at work in and through your dedication to work. Now, ladies, if you are a stay-at-home mom, you certainly have the most important career of all. Amen. Amen. Let me read you a little story. Author and preacher Tony Campolo said that when his wife Peggy was at home full time with their children and someone would ask, and what is it that you do, my dear? She would respond, I am socializing two homo sapiens into the dominant values of the Judeo-Christian tradition in order that they might serve to be instruments for the transformation of the social order into the kind of eschatological utopia that God willed from the beginning of creation. And then she would say to the other person, and what do you do? <laughs> Which kind of segues perfectly into big rock number three. Number three priority for us is the responsibility of raising your children. The responsibility of raising your children. And I'm using the word raising very intentionally there, as I believe the Bible does as well. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, where it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So here it's saying not, not just teaching. Yes, we are to teach, but not just teach, but to train. So training involves encouragement and inspiration and motivation, getting your hands dirty, demonstrating, providing the example. You know, not, not just from the chalkboard, but actually on the field. Um, I am currently coaching third and fourth grade boys basketball with, with our youngest son. And, um, you know, you have a choice as a coach. You can tell them what to do or you can show them what to do. And coaches who just tell them what to do, it really doesn't go really far with third and fourth graders. You know, I could stand there on the sidelines and say, rebound, 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 or I could tell them how to rebound, 
I can say, listen, when that shot goes up, either side, our shot or their shot, here's what I want you to do. I want you to see a man, touch a man, and then throw your butt into a man. You know, that thing. And, you know, and when you do that and you show them, they're like, <laughs> you know, not that they really do it. But anyway, you know, or I could just stand there and I could say, shoot better, shoot better. Come on, shoot better. Or I could teach them. I can get a ball and say, beef, you know, balance, eyes, elbow, follow through. You know, just the other night we were practicing and I was talking about defense. And you can tell your kids, you know, defend better, defend better, defend better. But if you don't show them, you know, if you get on there and you say, okay, here's how I want you to defend. I want, you, I want hands up. I want you down like this. And then don't watch his head and don't watch the ball. Watch his belly button because he can't go anywhere without his belly button. And then I'm there with the kids. I see your belly button. I see your, yup, yup, your belly button went with you. And you do that with the kids and, 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 and it teaches them better. But how much more? You know, then on the basketball court, then in life with our own children. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 6, New Revised Standard Version starts with the same word, train. Let's read it aloud together. Ready? Train children in the right way, and when old, they will not stray. I almost feel a rap coming on right there. Anyway, train, train. The word train in Hebrew is the word chanuk, and it means to narrow, to narrow. Remember Jesus said, he said, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, which really means a loss of well-being. But narrow is the gate, and confined or restricted is the way that leads to zoe life. Life and life more abundantly. Life the way that God has it. So part of our training is to be able to help our kids get in there and define the boundaries of life. What's in bounds? what's out of bounds, because all of us want our children to experience everything that God has for them. Can I get an amen on that? In Deuteronomy chapter 6, way back in the law, it says this, starting in verse 6. It says, And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So pretty much all the time. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So here, you know, even, even the Old Testament law, the Torah is saying, you know, for your children, you've got to put the Word of God in front of them. You've got to put it in front of them. Uh, now, Back then, and, and, and even into Jesus' day, Pharisees kind of applied this a little bit wrong. This is where they got their scripture for phylacteries and mezuzahs. So what they would do, oh, i got to keep the, the word of God on my hand and on the frontlets of my eyes. So they built boxes, phylacteries, and they put them on their foreheads and put a little scroll, you know, with verses there. And they, and they put a box here and put a scroll in there. And then they did a mezuzah. You know, even today, you can go into homes of Jewish families and you'll find a little box on the doorpost, usually very beautiful and ornate. And inside will be a scroll. And, you know, there, there is something very, very beautiful about that. I think, I think the Pharisees mixed it, missed it with their bo- but they get an A for effort, right? Um, but what he's saying here is, is, listen, if you want your children to really experience all that God has for them. And if you want your children to develop a love for the Word of God, have that love yourself. You know, again, today, even in Orthodox Judaism, and for many, many centuries before, what would happen is when there would be an infant, even a little baby, they would take out the Torah, the scroll, and they would open it up, and they would put a drop of honey on the scroll. And then they would take the baby and have the baby taste the honey on the scroll to say, look, the word of God is sweet. The word of God is good. Now, for you and I, we're not necessarily going to put drops of honey on our Bibles because it just gets really sticky. But, but it is being that example that, that I love the word of God, that I revere the word of God, that I take God at his word, that I trust him according to what is written. And, you know, We've got great stories about all, all of our children. Um, but I just want to share, because this just happened the other day with Gian, again, our youngest. He, he um, will tell Elena and I at different times of the day, out of nowhere, and I've shared this before, he'll just stop and just tell us he loves us. You know, out of nowhere, it'll be like, it'll be like Dad, I'll, yeah, Gian, he'll say, I love you. And, you know, and then we engage in the, well, I love you more. 
Well, I love you more. Well, I, and then we start with, well, you know, well, I love you as big as Texas. Well, I love you as big as the country. Well, I big, So we were up to the universe the other day. And, and he says, well, I love you the universe times two. And I said, well, I love you the universe times infinity. He said, I love you the universe times infinity times two. And I said, okay, well, you got me there. And then he says this. And then he says, but that means, and he gets really serious, he goes, but that means that I love you and mom, number two. Because I love God, number one. And just, you know, doesn't it warm your heart when your kids do something right? Right? <laughs> and, 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 and even when they get older, you know, there's a 15-year-old boy who came home from school uh, a little bit late towards dinner time and was expecting dinner. His mom always cooked dinner for him. And when he got in, the kitchen was quiet. Mom wasn't there. He was wondering what's up. And he goes upstairs into her bedroom and sees her in bed. And she doesn't look that good. And he says, Mom, what's what's going on? You don't feel well? And he says, well, as a matter of fact, I don't. I don't feel well. So he got concerned, and he paused, and he said, well, it's all right, Mom. I'm I'm, I'm getting getting big enough now. I mean, I'm 15 years old, and uh, I am big enough to carry you downstairs to the stove. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) Note to self, not that funny. Okay, (laughs) big rock number two, ready? Priority number two is keeping your till death do we part vows to your spouse. Keeping your till death do we part vows to your spouse. What did you vow on your wedding day? I've been officiating weddings for a little bit more than 25 years, and done a bunch of them here, and there are some elements that I very intentionally make sure are in the wedding ceremony on purpose. First one is, you know, we read. It's like the first thing we do is we read from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. Now, we don't have time to do that this morning, but in there you would find You know, the power of marriage and the purpose of marriage and the definition of marriage and the structure of marriage and the blessing of marriage and the mystery of marriage. But then that definitive passage ends with verse 33 where the Bible says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So it speaks of of selfless, sacrificial, serving love, respect and honor and preferring one another, the two becoming one. And I always incorporate in the wedding vows themselves the vow to be your spouse's very best friend. I always have them say, and I'll be your very best friend. The most recent and in-depth research shows that the number one ingredient to a lasting marriage is that you are and maintain being very best friends. Now, you might ask, why is your spouse number two, but the kids are number three? I'm glad you asked. This is one of those that if you jumble it up and you move the priorities, you can mess things up pretty good. Um, First of all, understand this, that... The greatest gift you can give to your children is to love your spouse. Greatest gift you can give to your children is to love your spouse. Dads, the greatest gift you can give to your kids is to love your wife. Moms, the greatest gift you can give to your kids is to love your husband. For for your children to see before their eyes over many years consistently, not a perfect marriage because those don't exist. Can I get an amen on that? There, yeah, I almost got a round of applause. Okay, listen. Those don't exist. Perfect marriages don't exist, except for Scott and Heather. But I, and then, that was awesome. I saw you just giving them love. That was really nice. Um, but those don't exist. But for your kids to see over time consistently, you know, a happy and healthy marriage, that, that is absolutely huge. Um, the truth is that there is only one thing that should ever Come before your marriage. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But your children should not come before your spouse. Your friends should never come before your spouse. Your work should never come before your spouse. Your hobbies, anything, 
anyone should never come before your spouse because marriage is a covenant. It's a covenant that, it, that is based on vows that you exchange before Almighty God. And therefore, those vows, they are sacred and they are holy. Now, a couple of things that I think we should cover. If you are single and you are interested in or attracted to someone who is not willing to make that kind of commitment to you, then they are not worthy of you. It is far better to find out now that someone is incompatible than to find out years after you are married that your differences are irreconcilable. Amen. That's really good advice. Another thing that I think we have to touch on and mention here is that if you are here today and you are divorced, this is in no way to condemn you. You know, the new covenant is absolutely emphatic. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone else condemns you, that's a them issue. And that is not their place. Are you following me? They don't even know what they don't know about what they don't know. Right? You want to repeat that after me? No, okay. They don't even know what they don't know about what they don't know. They don't know about you. They don't, they don't know about you. They don't know about what went on in your marriage. And guess what? God does. God does know what went on specifically in your marriage. And guess what he does? He forgives. And he loves. And he restores. Now, now, now quickly. Does God hate divorce? Absolutely he does. If you're taking notes, it's Malachi chapter 2 and verse 16. You don't need any interpretation because it says, I hate divorce, says the Lord. He hates divorce. Does God hate divorcees? Absolutely not. He loves them with an unwavering, inseparable, immutable, unchangeable love. And if you're taking notes, John chapter 4 is for that. God forgives, God restores, and God redeems. And uh, you, you say, well, okay, well then why does he hate divorce if he's going to forgive? and love Here's why God hates divorce, because he loves people. Because he loves us so very much. And he does not want us to go through the hurt and the very deep pain that is involved in divorce. So I think here's what's important for us who are divorced or have been through a divorce. It is very, very important that number one, we repent and that we learn the lessons of a failed relationship so that when God does restore, we don't repeat the same mistakes. You guys receive that? That's, that's with grace and truth. Are you following me? Grace and, Jesus does say, I don't condemn you, but he also does say, go and sin no more. So it's important that we learn the lessons so that, again, we don't go through that same ugly and hurtful situation over and over again. So loving your spouse is second only to the first and final big rock to priority numero uno, and that is, number one, your eternal relationship with God. Your eternal relationship with God. This is the biggest rock in your jar. This is the top priority. And I kind of want to go at it at a little bit of different angle than we, what you would traditionally suspect today. Uh, children of Israel, they're in Egypt. They're under hard taskmasters and they cry out to be released. God raises up Moses and Moses leads them out of Egypt through the Red Sea that parts. You know the story. And they go into the wilderness. And a 40-day journey from uh, the Red Sea to the Jordan winds up being a 40-year journey. Why? Because of their stubbornness. Because of their hard-heartedness because of their self-absorption and their self-centeredness and that whatever God provided wasn't good enough. We want, we want more. God provides his presence, like pillar of cloud by day, fire by night. Yeah, but we want more. God provides us with leadership. Yeah, but you know what? Let's go with a golden calf and Aaron instead. And God gives them manna on their doorstep. Yeah, but you know, we get a little tired of that. We want meat. And so God gives them so much quail, it comes out their nose. How many of you know that's too much quail? But anyway, you know, they always want more. They always want more. Not enough. Not enough. And so they they wind up perishing in the wilderness. They wind up dying there and never seeing this amazing land of promise. But their children, 
are now, 40 years later, on the brink of this land of promise, this land that's supposed to flow with milk and honey, this amazing place that God said he'd give to them. And they are there. Moses hasn't made it either. He's passed away, and now Joshua is leading them. And just before they cross over into this amazing place of promise, God tells Joshua to tell the people something very specific. It's found in Joshua chapter 3 and verse 5. It's, it's like my second favorite verse in the whole Old Testament. It says, and Joshua Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Say that with me. Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify. Sanctify simply means to set apart for holy usage. To set apart as sacred. To set apart all that is sinful, from all that is sinful, to God. It means to put God first. It means to make Him the number one big rock in your jar. Make Him first. Why? Not just because He's some sort of cosmic lawgiver that says, I must be first. That's not why. The why is for us. Sanctify yourselves. Make me first so that I can do wonders among you. The reason why God wants to be the first one in our lives, the number one place that we'd have no other gods before him is because he wants to transform our lives from what we once were, even from what we are now, to what he desires us to be. He wants to do in our lives what we cannot do for ourselves. Sanctify yourself. So how do you do that? How do you sanctify yourself? How do you do that practically? Well, real quickly, first of all, it's through the Word of God. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, John chapter 17, high priestly prayer of Jesus. He says, Father, sanctify them through your Word. Your Word is truth. And so we're sanctified. We're set apart to God. We put Him first by reading and meditating and pondering His Word. Now listen. You've probably already been bombarded in your inbox or however because the first of the year is coming and people are going to want you to read that Bible in a year. Read through your whole Bible in one year and here's the plan. You've heard me say it before. I'm going to say it again. Ready? As your pastor, don't do it. Don't, don't put that on yourself. You've got enough burdens, right? When you do the whole read your Bible in a year thing, man, you're, you are headed for condemnation in just about, oh, 20 days. Because you're going to get behind in your reading, then you're going to feel like, oh, man, now instead of reading six chapters a day, I've got to read 18 today. Okay, let's go. And that, that doesn't change anybody. Last time I checked. Are you following me? Don't do it. Don't read through your Bible in a year. I've got a great suggestion for you. Take one verse, put it everywhere. I'm not talking about building a phylactery or anything, but put it on your refrigerator. Put it on your phone as your homepage. You know, as soon as you turn on your phone, there it is. And keep it there for a month. And read it. And ponder. And meditate. And ruminate. And chew on it. And chew on it until you've got it cold. Until, ready, the Lord has told you about 20 things from that one verse. Because he will. And then February the 1st, pick a new verse. And do one verse per month. I'm going to tell you right now, if you will, now, you should read beside that. I'm not saying that's all you're reading, but I'm saying just take that one verse and really chew on it. By the end of the year, you will have memorized and thought through and hidden way down deep in your heart. Twelve verses. I'm going to tell you right now, that'll transform you. I said, that'll transform you. I feel like the sixth sense. I see dead people. I said, that, that, that will transform you. Now, if, you say, if some of you say, well, that's, you know, that's kind of weak. You know, Twelve, that's kind of, you know, that's bar is pretty low, then, then here's, do this, do one per week. How you like me now? That's 52, right? 52, do 52. But, it, but you can. Imagine if you did 52 verses this year. It would be, it would be mind-blowing. It transform you. Here's the other way. Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Real quickly, here's the other way that you set yourself apart by practicing the presence of God. 
so that your prayer is happening very fluently, very seamlessly, very conversationally, whenever, wherever, all the time. When you get up in the morning and you're making coffee and you're just whispering a thanks to God. You're asking him to ha- help you handle the things that are coming up in your day. You're asking for wisdom. One of my personal goals for 2013 is I want to ask God for wisdom every single day in 2013. Just ask him for wisdom. God, give me wisdom today. You know, and then when you're in the car on the way to work, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for my family. I just, I pray for my kids right now. And when you're at work, when you're at work, you got to, you know, make sure you take the volume down or people will think you're crazy, okay? Don't start shouting praises, but just, you know, but you just whisper a thank you. You whisper a prayer, just a quick prayer. But you do it, you practice the presence of God. Why? Because he is with you always. Every single nanosecond of your existence, he's there. So practice the presence of God. If we do those two things, we'll sanctify the Lord in our hearts. We'll sanctify ourselves, and we'll see him. See, here's the thing. We'll grow closer. We'll just grow closer. And there's something so dynamic about that, we don't have time to talk about it. Let me see if I can finish this up. You're a very long-winded group today, so. Oh, this is so important. Please, please listen carefully. We do none of this, none of it, to earn or deserve God's favor or approval. Are you hearing me? I don't read the Bible so that God will be happy with me. That is all wrong. I I don't do any of it to do that. No, no, no. Everything that we're talking about is a response. It is a response to his grace. It's a response to his unmerited favor. I do all of this because he first loved me. You know why I seek the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because when I was lost, he sought me first. I do all of this because of what he has already done on Calvary's cross. I read, I pray, I seek, not to become righteous, but because he has made me righteous. Not to earn blessing, but because I am already blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. You're following me. I don't do do this to earn God's acceptance. I am already accepted in the beloved and freely forgiven. Check this out. I make his priorities mine because he first made my eternal salvation his top priority. Let's conclude with my favorite verse in the Old Testament. And it just goes along with this. It's Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32. Let's read it aloud together. Ready? Ready? But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Let's read it again louder. Ready? But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Listen to me real, real, real quickly. The Lord wants to do great things, amazing things in your life, for your life, and through your life. He does. He wants you to be strong, if you'll notice, for whatever comes your way. And it all starts when we set ourselves to really know him. When we make that our number one priority. So number one is our eternal relationship with God. Number two is our relationship with our spouse. Number three is raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Number four is our dedication to work. And number five is our commitment to our local church. Jesus said it like this. He said, seek first. First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then, all these things. Shall be added unto you. Hey, can I say something I didn't say in the first service? You notice a couple of those little stones fell over and fell out. A couple of them are on the ground. A couple of them are over there. You know what? If these stones fall out, big deal. No, really. Big deal. If those stones fall out, big deal. Amen. Let's pray.
Lord, I, I am personally overwhelmed with the thought that you made us your priority. Undeserving us. Foolish us, sinful us. You made us your number one priority. So much so that you gave your only begotten son. Lord, today I pray that you give us all wisdom on how to make and keep first things first. How to make and keep the things that are truly important, even eternal. The impact we'll have on our coworkers, it could be eternal. The way we serve at church, maybe teach a child. That has the potential to be eternal. Certainly what we do with our children and they do with their children and the children that can be eternal. Our spouse's sanctification is eternal. Lord, give us wisdom. Above all, to put you first. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. Before we pray any further, do you need to put God first? Do you need to put Him first? Have you ever before accepted personally, you, accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord? Have you ever personally prayed a prayer from your heart through your lips in which you've said, Jesus, I give you my life. You're number one. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a fresh start, a new beginning. Have you prayed a prayer like that? Because if you haven't, today's your day. And I want to pray with you in just a moment. Maybe you'd say to me, hey, John, you know, I did. There was a time that the Lord was really, he, he was my number one priority. He was, he was he was that big rock in my jar. But then I turned around and I walked away. And Today I can't say that with confidence. I can't say that he's number one. But today I'd like to return to that place in life where he is. I'd like to put him in that seat of primacy in my life. If that's you, you fall into either one of those two categories. While everybody has their heads bowed and their eyes closed, please, nobody looking around. If you would say to me, hey, John, I need to do that today. I, pray with me, man. Pray, pray with me. Pray for me. I want to make Jesus Christ the number one priority in my life. I want to make him my Lord. If that's you, would you please let me know? Let me know who I'm praying for by doing the following. If it's you, just quickly, right at your seat, while no one else is looking, just quickly raise your hand, wave it at me, and put it right back down. Do that right now, if that's you. Yes, good. And put your hand right back down. Anybody else? Let's pray. I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me with all of your heart. Say this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And with my heart, I believe. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died for my sin and rose from the dead. Today, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I'm coming home to you, Lord. And I put you first. Thank you for accepting me just as I am. Thank you for forgiving me and giving me new life. I will live for you just as I pray this prayer by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's great. Hey, listen, we've got a couple announcements for you before we go. Real quickly, if you haven't already filled out a Hey, I'm Here card, they're in the seat backs all over the place, but especially if you have a prayer request, 
fill that card out for us. Or if it's your first, second, or third time with us, take a moment, fill out the whole thing, and place it in the little boxes by the door on your way out. If it's your first time, take that card with you to the information desk in the lobby, and we've got a gift for you there. Uh, a couple of other announcements. Next week, next Sunday, we start a brand new series entitled Breaking Through. Watch this video with me for a moment. When faced with the adversities of life, we have a choice to break down or to break through. Starts next week, next Sunday. Now listen carefully. This is a prime time of the year to invite unchurched friends, family, co-workers, and neighbors. So I really want you to take it to heart this week and pray and see who the Lord places on your heart to not only invite, but to invite and bring. Now, next Sunday, to kick off this whole season and this new series, immediately following this service, we're going to have a meal together. We were doing the big grill burger Sundays. We've done them. This time, it's cornbread and soup next week. Cornbread and soup. We are going to clear out the chairs from here. We're going to put tables up right after this service, and we're just going to have a lot of fun together, a time of fellowship, and a meal together. It's going to be wonderful. Now, we need some more. We have a handful of people who have signed up, but we need some more right at the information desk, right after this service. Go out there and sign up to make either cornbread or your favorite soup or both. So uh, go out there and sign up after this. Now, real quickly, another thing that I need you to mark your calendar on starting today, and that is Saturday, January the 26th, the last Saturday of this month, we're going to ask you to invest into yourself and into your children in a very dynamic way. We are hosting on that day a seminar by a group called Walk Through the Bible. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They've been around probably 40 years or whatever. They have a dynamic, crazy way of being able to teach us the entire Old Testament in one day in a way in which you will be able to find Jesus in every book of the Old Testament. You'll be able to know everything that happens, the major themes. You'll be able to explain the Old Testament to somebody else in three minutes. I know some of you are going, you talking about me? <laughs> yes. Hey, real quickly. I know we're running late. Watch this. So, th so this is the Bible. Well, these days it might even turn on like this. The Bible is large, it is old, it was around when people looked like this. How does it apply to me? I mean, it's longer than 140 characters. Where do I begin? It can be intimidating. Why do I need to learn the Old Testament? Why not just skip over to the New Testament? Well, consider this. Did you know that Jesus quotes the Old Testament? God's story of salvation and love begins in the Old Testament? Or did Jesus lived during Old Testament times? Maybe you like Genesis and Exodus is pretty epic, but what is the deal with Leviticus? And what's a Habakkuk? Walk through the Old Testament can answer all these questions in a few hours. Yeah, that's right, you can learn the entire Old Testament in a few hours. You can learn it in the time it takes to fly from New York to LA, or in the time it takes to build that bookshelf from that funny sounding furniture store. Walk Through the Old Testament is the creative idea of Walk Through the Bible. Over 10 million people have discovered Walk Through the Bible live events. God's big plan in the Old Testament is really a rescue plan, an amazingly true story of how God wanted a relationship with His people. It's filled with drama, excitement, and family tension. Plus, there's a dude named Jethro. It's not just knowledge, it's a foundation upon which everything else in your life should be built on. Knowing the Old Testament helps you understand God, His plans, His justice, His love, and how you fit into all of it. God has a plan for your life. Understanding the Old Testament is understanding God better. So, what if you could learn the entire Old Testament in just a few hours? What if you could know it so well you could tell a friend in three minutes? Well, you can. Tend to walk through the Old Testament, learn the Old Testament in just a few hours. Remember it and apply it to the rest of your life. So we're hosting this January the 26th. 
It is an investment in yourself. There is a cost involved. I don't, we don't have that all worked out. We're trying to do a family discount as well because we're going to have it for adults. And we're going to have an instructor from Walk Through the Bible for our children as well so that they'll be learning the same thing on their level. It is a mind-blowing, creative method and strategy that they have that you will walk out of there understanding your Old Testament like never before. So next week we'll kind of present the cost, be ready to start purchasing tickets. We're also publicizing this outside of Turning Point into all love it because we think it's a good thing for everybody. So just mark it on your calendar now because you're going to need to block out that day to do that and that is Saturday, January the 26th. Stand with me if you will. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who will also do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a happy new year. Have a safe celebration. We'll see you next week.